So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to this talk. My name is Chandra. And today I'm going to talk about uh, how the Sertura prover works. So um, maybe you have seen uh, a picture like this before. So here is a very high level view of what the Sertura prover is. So essentially, it's a tool that takes some code and a specification, uh, which is a, a formal statement of the correct behavior of the program. Um, and it gives us one of two things. So either it tells us that the code uh, matches the formal specification, or it comes up with a counterexample, uh, which is you know, uh, one particular scenario where the code does not in fact match the spec. So this is a very, very high level view of what search approval is. But in today's talk, we want to take a slightly closer look and see exactly how the search approver accomplishes this task. So if we try to gradually expand on this, so you know, if you take a slightly closer look, uh, you know, what is really happening in search approver is that it's taking this code and the spec and it's converting it, uh, converting it into something like a logical formula, right? And uh, so a logical formula is something like P implies Q, P or Q and, and things like that. So if you have uh, ever done a, uh, you know, any logic class, then maybe you have seen something like that. So the idea is that once we can convert the uh, code and the spec into a logical formula, then we can use uh, solvers, which are specialized tools that can check the validity of these logical formula. And that's how the search approval works, okay? Uh, but the problem is that uh, we work with code and spec, right? They don't actually look like logical formula at all, right? So uh, a lot of the work that the search approver does is uh, to make it easier to go from this you know, program that's written in the, in, the, in the Solidity file, for example, and the specification into something that is a logical formula. So um, you can sort of think of uh, the search approver doing three uh, big things. And not necessarily in this order, but these are the three things that we are going to uh, uh, talk about today. So one of the things that we do is we try to break down this uh, code and spec into simpler and smaller operations. And that helps us uh, you know, analyze each of these smaller steps uh, or smaller operations more efficiently. Another thing we do is we want to uh, convert this code into, uh, we want to simplify it, right? And we want to optimize it. And that also takes us one step closer to generating uh, these logical formula. But it's important to note that no matter what kind of simplification or optimization we do, we need to make sure that they actually don't change the semantics. So they have to be meaning preserving and they shouldn't change what the code originally intended to do. And the, uh, the final thing is that the Sertura prover provides a uh, ergonomic uh, domain specific language that lets you write down the specifications for, the, for your program. So those are sort of the three things that we are going to uh, cover in, in this talk. So uh, now that I've told you that, if we uh, try to take an even closer look at the prover, you will see that you know, these things are accomplished in a somewhat complex way, right? So the architecture is uh, quite complex as you can see from this uh, figure. Uh, and this is still a simplification, right? So this is still not covering all the details. Uh, but uh, the goal is to go over this uh, with an example and see how uh, it all works. So uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions at any point in the talk. Uh, you don't have to wait for the, to, uh, to, to, till the end. Okay, so uh, to actually sh show you how the prover works, uh, let's first take an example of a small uh, smart contract. So here is a, a very simple uh, smart contract and uh, this is in Solidity. So uh, let me just give you a quick overview of what this program is doing. So first off, uh, the name of this contract is bank. It has a mapping from addresses to the amounts that are stored in the, in the form of unsigned 256-bit integers. Uh, then it has a deposit function that takes an amount as an argument and it increases the funds of the sender by that amount. And then finally, we have a, a getter function uh, which is a read-only function that can look up the amount in a specific uh, fund. Okay, so this is a, a fairly simple smart contract. Now, once you have written this, uh, you might want to think about whether the smart contract is, the, these functions are actually doing what you expected it to do. So uh, for example, uh, one property that you might be interested in, in this case, is that uh, whether deposit increases the fund of the sender by amount. Right, so that is something that is 
kind of important and maybe you want to check that. So one way to check that is uh, you can look very carefully at the code and you can think really hard and you know you can uh, you know after you know really carefully reading the code you can come up you know maybe convince yourself that yeah this uh, program is correct and it matches the spec. The way the searcher approver does it is a more automated way. So uh, how does a searcher approver take a code like that and the specification like the one we saw and automatically tell you whether the code matches the spec? The first thing that the prover does is it takes the Solidity program that we just saw, and it actually just compiles it using you know, existing Solidity compilers. And once you do that, what you get is EVM bytecode. And uh, this design decision, you know, this, design, this decision of working at the bytecode level, which is what Sertra does, has a few advantages. So one is that uh, you know, it is possible to support other EVM-based languages uh, in the future, because if they all uh, uh, compile to bytecode, then it's uh, slightly easier than if uh, you know, we were working at the source level. Uh, and another uh, advantage is that you know, because we work at the bytecode level, we don't actually have to trust the compiler. And in fact, because of this decision, we have been able to find uh, multiple bugs in the Solidity compiler over the years. Uh, so here are uh, some examples of bugs we've found. Um, you can go and look at our website and read uh, about more details on what these bugs were. So that is uh, one of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the best advantages, uh, in my opinion, of you know, this uh, working at the, the bytecode level. And uh, we are also actively working on supporting other uh, low-level representations. So for example, WASM is another example that we would be interested in uh, supporting. Okay, so what we have seen so far is that we took the Solidity program, we ran the compiler, we got the bytecode. Now the next step is to further simplify this EVM bytecode. Now remember that our ultimate goal is to go from this code and spec to a logical formula. So everything that we're doing in between is uh, helping us get closer to that ultimate goal, right? So the next step is to convert the bytecode into uh, something called TAC. So TAC is our proprietary IR. Uh, it, uh, there are, um, you know, it actually stands for three address code. And uh, normally, you know, uh, this, it's, uh, there's other versions of three address code out there, but we have a specific uh, kind of uh, uh, intermediate representation that we support. And uh, there are a few advantages of working at the TAC level. So one is, that uh, it's a lot simpler. And uh, you know, every TAC instruction does one thing and one thing only, right? And that is actually not true for programs that you write at the Solidity level, because you know, uh, one line can do a lot of things implicitly that you don't necessarily see. So that's one advantage of working at the TAC level. And also it makes uh, analysis a lot easier because there's only a small number of instructions that are supported in TAC, and so, but you know, they still cover all the operations you would do at the Solidity level, but it makes it easier to uh, do uh, program analysis. Okay, so now we've converted into TAC and uh, you know, I skipped through a few things. So for example, there's a lot of uh, you know, really interesting optimizations uh, and simplifications we do after we convert it into TAC. Um, and before I uh, go any further uh, in the pipeline, I also want to give you a quick example of what this uh, really means. So uh, if you just want to compare the TAC we generate and the original program that we started with, you'll see that the TAC is a lot bigger. And the reason is because what I said earlier, right? So, you know, uh, the high level Solidity program is a lot more compact, but when you expand it and you, you know, explicitly write out every intermediate step, then it becomes a much bigger program. So that's, you're not really expected to read the TAC program here. It's just to give you an idea of like the difference between the, the thing we started with and what we have at this point. Okay, so now we have generated this, uh, this intermediate representation. And um, you know, it turns out that even once you have this TAC representation, uh, the instructions in TAC can have very subtle dependencies. And it is very important for us to be able to carefully understand them uh, in order for any analysis to be correct. So we do a lot of static analysis on the TAC level to gather important facts about the programs at different, about the program at different points. Uh, so one such example is points to analysis, but that's only one thing we do. There's a lot of other uh, analyses and optimizations that happen. Uh, for example, we also do, uh, you know, we also try to optimize out um, any redundant, uh, you know, uh, bitwise operations, for example. So that's yet another operation we do. And these are all happening at the TAC level. 
So just to give you one example, let's take this, uh, the points to uh, information. So um, let's take a, uh, like a concrete example. So imagine that you have this uh, little program here. So you have X and Y and uh, F, uh, both of them, have, th these are structs and they have some field F, right? And you assign uh, to Y's field F, you assign the value three. Now, using the kind of analysis we do, if we can dis uh, like, you know, like confidently say that this assignment uh, to Y's field F does not in fact change X, then we can actually simplify the program quite a bit, right? So for example, here, this Y dot F equals three, which is a third line, if we can show that this does not affect X, then you can actually remove those two lines of code and you can just you know, have this guarantee that you know, that right is not going to affect X at all. So this kind of analysis, and this is only one example of uh, an analysis that we do, what this lets us do is it lets us uh, break down uh, memory operations into these disjoint sets and we can guarantee non-interference between these disjoint sets. And uh, the nice thing about that is that eventually when we generate the logical formula for the solvers uh, to uh, check for, uh, those formula are actually a lot simpler if we uh, rather, you know, compared to what we would have otherwise had if we didn't do any kind of analysis. So that's the power of doing this kind of analysis uh, at the TAC level before we generate the, uh, the logical formula. Great. So now we have seen how we started at the solidity level and we went all the way down to this TAC level. We, you know, optimized out a lot of things. We made the code a lot simpler. But, you know, and so it sounds like we're kind of getting closer to generating the verification conditions, but we still haven't actually done it. So this is where, uh, you know, the specification comes in because in order to generate the conditions um, that, you know, are going to eventually become the, the logical formula, we need to know what the spec is. And uh, we're gonna look at, uh, you know, how the, the, the program and the spec sort of uh, come together to help us get the logical formula. But before I do that, I want to quickly give you uh, this, you know, a little bit of an overview of the underlying principles and the ideas that guide us uh, towards this uh, goal. So um, we use this thing called, we are based on this idea called four triple. So uh, the idea of four triple was proposed uh, by uh, Tony Hoare, who is a very famous computer scientist. And, uh, you know, this is a very concise way of specifying properties that your program should satisfy. So the way you write this, is uh, you have some property P, you have some program S, and you have some property Q. And the way you read this is that if P holds before you executed your program S, then Q must hold after executing S. And you know uh, this is just the, the actual property that you write, but the harder part is to actually prove the property, right? And that's the kind of thing that we want to do. So one way to uh, prove this is to use this idea called weakest precondition. And what does this do? So uh, basically the idea is that uh, we want to come up with the weakest predicate that holds uh, in the beginning of, you know, before you start executing S, such that Q will be true after you are done executing S. So how do we come up with this weakest precondition? There's a very uh, standard way to do it. You sort of assume you start off, you know, with the, uh, the, the post condition, which is Q, and you work backwards in the program S. And eventually you reach the top of the program and you figure out what is the weakest predicate that has to be true at the top so that once S is done executing, Q will be true at the end. So there is a way to do this. You know, you figure out what this weakest precondition is. And now once you have figured out what the weakest precondition is, in order to prove the original Hoare triple, all you need to do is show that uh, your uh, actual precondition P implies this weakest precondition. Right, and so that is really the, the goal of uh, doing this kind of uh, you know whole logic based uh, analysis of your program. So now, what do we have? We know that you know if we can show that P implies this weakest precondition, and we also know that the weakest pre, uh, the weakest precondition that we have does satisfy this whole triple, which is you know uh, W P uh, S Q. So from these two together, we can say that the whole triple we started with P S Q is in fact true. Uh, now, if you look carefully, you will already see that we have somehow landed in this formula that looks a little bit like logic, right? In fact, this is a logical formula. So, you know, we started off with the program S, 
And you know, we already know what S is, right? Because we started with the Solidity program and I showed you how we went through all those steps. And eventually we had this you know, a simplified uh, but equivalent TAC program. So that is our S. So the only bits that are missing are P and Q. Now, if we can find what P and Q are, then we can find the weakest precondition and then we can have this uh, logical formula that looks like this. And you know, our original goal of converting the code and the spec to this logical formula will be satisfied. So where do this P and Q come from? So that's really the next, the next key question that we need to answer. So uh, the P and Q actually come from the spec. So let's understand what this spec actually is. So uh, going back to the, the program that we started with. So here we had uh, this um, uh, function deposit that was taking an amount and it was updating the fund of the sender by amount. And what we wanted to check was whether deposit increased fund by amount. And the way, you know, the way Sertura Prover works, uh, in order to check this kind of specification, you need to be able to write it in a more formal way. And in order to facilitate that, uh, the Sertura Prover also provides a language for specifying these properties called CVL. So uh, I'm gonna walk you through what this, uh, this, this specification is saying, but one thing to note here is that this is actually not an executable uh, program, right? So this is not a program that you run. Um, but it's a specific, it's a declarative uh, programming language where you can specify properties about your program. And uh, maybe you can already see that this looks a lot like the Solidity program that we saw earlier. And that is actually by design, right? So we wanted this uh, language to be as similar to Solidity as possible so that if you're familiar with Solidity, then you, know, you can also uh, easily uh, start using CVL to specify programs. Okay, so what is this specification saying? So um, here we have the name of this, this rule uh, in this file is called deposit okay. It takes an argument amount. And uh, there's this thing called environment. Uh, so environment is, uh, is sort of an explicit uh, representation of uh, various var variables that are actually implicit in, in the EVM. So for example, you know, if you have a, a specified this environment, then you can actually access message sender and message value and other uh, fields uh, explicitly. So now we have set up the environment. And uh, so the specification kind of you know, starts, uh, you start to see what the specification is doing now. So before we make a call to deposit, we want to know what funds sender has. So we are gonna get that and store it in before deposit. And then we're going to call deposit, right? So here, this is where we are going to inline uh, the, the function body of deposit from the contract that we saw. And then after deposit, we are also going to get the funds from the sender and store that in this variable called after deposit. And finally, we can write this assertion. So what this assertion is saying is essentially what our property was, right? So it's saying that after deposit should be the same as before deposit plus amount. And that is our, pre, that is our post condition, right? So that is the property that we want our deposit function to satisfy. And now you can see that using this language, you can nicely, in a concise way, but in a very you know, formal way, you can write down uh, what the specification uh, should do. Okay, so uh, the last thing I wanna talk about, say, uh, about the CVL and you know, uh, more about the technology that the search approver uses is that um, if you just look at this, you might also wonder that, well, can't I get the same kind of guarantee from testing? And the answer is yes, you can, uh, but it's worth remembering that you know, amount, if you look at the type of amount, you will notice that it's an unsigned 256 bit integer, right? So if you really want to do a proper you know, exhaustive testing, then you'll have to test it for each and every value of amount. And there's a lot of values of amount. In fact, there's 202 to the power of 256 different values of amount. And of course you can't really test through all of them. But you know, the Sertura approver does actually guarantee that this property holds for all amounts, right? Uh, so how does it actually do that? Uh, it, the, you know, the, the underlying technology is, uh, you know, this, uh, the technology of constraint solvers, which are actually very, very efficient at uh, proving these kinds of properties without doing exhaustive enumeration. And because the Sertura approver relies on that technology, it is also able to give you these kinds of guarantees. Okay, so at this point, um, we are done, almost done, right? So we have taken the program, we have taken the spec, and we have walked through the whole pipeline, and we have gotten to a point where we actually do have a logical formula. Now, all we need to do 
is uh, check whether the logical formula is in fact valid or not. And for that, uh, the Sertora prover uses constraint solvers. So um, the, there are actually a lot of really, really good constraint solvers out there, for example, Z3 and CVC5 and the ISIS. And so these solvers have, are actually very, very efficient uh, and are highly scalable in checking these kinds of logical formula. In fact, a lot of the times for some of our benchmarks, the logical formula we generate are really big. And even then the constraint solvers are able to very efficiently handle them. So uh, this is basically the last step. So what happens is you give the formula to the solver and the solver checks for the validity. And if it is valid, then you know, we are good to go. Otherwise it will find a counterexample. So uh, let's just try to put it all together. So if we go back to the program that we have been looking at this whole time, which is that bank uh, contract. So uh, if you actually go to uh, this website, demo.certora.com, and if you uh, paste the code from the contract that we looked at and you paste the specification that I showed you, you will, and if you run the Certora approver, you will actually see that the Certora approver does find a counterexample, right? So uh, it turns out that this seemingly harmless looking function that we wrote isn't actually always correct. In fact, uh, it runs into an overflow, uh, overflow problem if amount is uh, too big, right? And the search approver can actually catch that and it can tell you that here is a specific instance where you know, for this value of amount, uh, you know, the, the, pre, the post condition that you wanted does not hold. So, uh, and of course I should uh, also mention that uh, if you're using solidity 0.8, then this problem, you will probably not see the overflow problem because uh, the solidity uh, 0.8 has introduced a check that specifically pr uh, prevents this uh, overflow from happening. But it's still, the point still holds that, you know, uh, the prover, the search prover can find these kinds of bugs. And uh, this is also um, one of, you know, a fairly simple property that the prover can check. But in practice, you know, we are able to check much more complex properties and we're also able to work on uh, much more complex solidity programs that are much longer and have much more complex computations. Um, so that actually brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, so the whole point of this uh, presentation was to give you a somewhat closer look at what is really happening inside the search approver. And hopefully it helps you understand uh, the underlying technology. And uh, yeah, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.